stage. Can you please give a round of applause? So, Ilza, this was a nine year journey for you, which culminated uh, with the Country Champ Award at Annecy 2020, which is a prestigious animation festival in France. You got two Latvian film prizes, which are the Oscar equivalent of, for Latvia Best Animated Feature Film and Best Director. You got three additional nominations for Best Screenplay, Sound and Score, and it was your first feature doc debut, co-founded by the Norwegian Film Institute. So let me start by asking the first question, how did this journey come about? How did you manage to get the Norwegian Film Institute involved? Because this is a very Latvian Baltic project to begin with. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you see. Uh, Closer. Uh, I have. Uh, I have been um, working in Norway uh, as a documentary director together with my husband uh, in our own company since 1998, and they knew me as a director previously. Um, so they said. Uh, the Norwegian Film Institute, they perhaps had trust in me as a director, so the story, uh, I guess, is of importance not only for the Baltic region, but also for the uh, world as such, because, <laughs> because we are um, um, facing questions of choices in our lives all the time. Um, with elections and with questions of trust, which politicians do you trust before you go to voting? And I guess the Norwegians saw this perspective of democracy building in my film as important to give support and to give a historical perspectives to their own life of democracy building in their society. And the film definitely uh, touches upon lots of subjects. Um, you operate on a very vast canvas. You talk about the World War II, you talk about the Cold War, you talk about the Soviet-controlled Latvia, that period in your life. But still, yeah, you managed to make this film feel so personal, so intimate. So what's your secret? Oh, um, I have been interested in history all the time. Uh, so uh, the stories from the war have been with me uh, all the time since I have been growing up. And then there is this saying that the history is written by the winners. Uh, and in the case of World War II, I felt since I was small that it was unjust that the name of my country was deleted from the globe. I actually had many visuals and planning for this film, how to show that you are a child, you are small, you are looking at the globe of the, the map, and the city of your capital, Riga, is mentioned, but you don't have the country. And I, I, I think that was one of the first uh, motivations which I had um, in me to tell the story. Yes, we still exist, we have our own country still. <laughs> Um, we are like, I don't know, in this, the country is the size of uh, one suburb of London, but we still manage to have our own state. Okay. And uh, the film does, um, does feel very autobi autobiographical, but there must have been some instances, instances where you maybe borrowed experiences from somebody else and just uh, put them in the movie. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, it, it was a difficult process uh, to make this film by my own story because I feel it's not dramatic enough. I haven't done anything uh, big enough and anything important enough or anything funny enough uh, to, to make it as a feature film, let's say. But there is this very tiny little thing that uh, like people 
from the people like me making very small things, this is how we make our society. As I always said to school children, we all can be Greta Thunbergs. Somebody is in front and somebody is those supporters with those small things. And my biggest thing was to make this protest letter at school just to encourage other girls to, 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 to action protest against the military. But uh, yes, I borrowed stories especially from World War II. Uh, I started with my grandmother and uh, I interviewed her. Then I interviewed several relatives, and at the end, I had to take those first interviews out to manage to make a picture, as you say, the, the big canvas, a kind of to fit in the story of um, uh, people to, to, to get it more general, like the story of the soldier which was shot on the street because of the bicycle. Um, I, uh, I took from the Archives of War Museum because um, I had more dramatic stories actually from my relatives, but then I had to explain so much more in the film who they are and how do they get, in, get to them into the story. So it was a big puzzle, it was difficult, but at the end I'm very happy how it uh, sorted out. And Ilza the girl um, really grows up fast before our very eyes. Um, how, when is it that moment that you comprehended freedom of choice and what it meant, really? Can, can you recall at what age maybe you were and what happened that made you realize that? Uh, uh, well, for me, it was a very dramatic moment when mom came home uh, after that meeting and she, that is very documentary. She didn't turn on the light in the hall because she was so ashamed and so sad that she had to join the Communist Party. And we discussed a lot of those things at home, how it is, why do you have to join the party, and so. Um, I guess that's from the age of 10. I really started to look that there are two signs sides of the life, which is one that's official outside and one which we keep at home. Uh, like there was a, <laughs> it was an episode, you know, we, we were not allowed to celebrate Christmas as a Christian Christmas. Uh, we were allowed to celebrate New Year and uh, call all the New Year trees, we call them New Year trees, decorated. They were kind of allowed to appear from the end of December, kind of from the 28th or 7th of December, but not around the Christmas Eve. So we had in our flat in first floor the Christmas tree, and uh, me and my brother, we were asking to lighten the candles on the tree, and then my mom said, okay, if you're going to lighten the candles in your, at your tree, then you had to put all the electric lights on so nobody from the street could see that we have lights in the Christmas tree. Um, and I guess that was one of the moments I understood that we are really living in two realities. Um, and you, you definitely use the film as a tool for self-reflection. Um, can you recall some of the best and worst moments from your childhood in the 70s and 80s? Um, you see, uh, as I'm trying to show in the film, um, I had to cope with the loss of my father very early. And um, during script writing, I struggled a lot to explain what does it mean to be like a person like him. He, uh, I guess you could, I don't know, all the levels of the world uh, word uh, opportunist because he wanted a career, he wanted to achieve something, he was very active. And uh, now, later from the 30 years of distance, you can say that he was a, just a communist. And I am trying to say no, uh, when I am going back to this village where he was, more than 40 years ago, they still remember him for the things he did. And it's so difficult to explain how is the life in the Soviet um, circumstances where you are not allowed to be active to do something for your people because you need only this one ticket, the, the ticket of the membership of the Communist Party. That was one of the biggest struggles for me, how to explain it, not to be 
uh, marked as a communist, uh, in my opinions, when I'm defending him. And I'm defending him, of course, foremost, because he's my father and I still miss him. So, um, yeah, the limes, the limes. Uh, I, I remember there was this crisis of butter. <laughs> so it all started. <laughs> that is what, what, what I clear, clearly remember from the 70s. And of course, I remember very many phrases and sayings. You know, the capitalism was bad and it was stinking and it was uh, stinking so badly because it was rottening. The Soviet system was going up and we said, oh, we love the smell of the rotten capitalism when people uh, received some postcards or chocolates from their relatives in the West. Uh, it is a powerful indictment of war, um, your film, uh, and you, you chose to use both media of animation and documentary to explain that. Um, why bo using both media? And maybe now we can also bring in your husband. So can we please uh, have a round of applause for Trond Jakobson? He was... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that uh, animation and those archives, they are empowering each other in the use. They are saying, like I mentioned, the emotional truth is in animation, especially this um, sequence when we became members of the pioneer organization. Uh, the fear, I can't find it in any state archives. And, uh, uh, and people, let's say in my town, there lived 12,000 people. There were two 8 millimeter cameras, uh, two people on them. They were not insane. I mean, they were not picking the media, going to uh, school and document the uh, uh, event of becoming a, their child becoming a member of the communist organization. It's, it's not what you document as a joyful event of your life. So I had to make that in animation. So I mean, uh, combining the state archives, chronicles with the animation, you get the whole picture more together. So what will you say about animation? Uh, so uh, Trond is uh, the uh, producer of the film and co-director of the animation bit. So can you tell us about your experience of working on the film? Yeah, I will. I, will. I, I just thought about something when you told about those two guys with the cameras. Uh, of course, for us, this movie is also about the world we live in today and how democracy is struggling also in Europe. And only three days ago, two Norwegian journalists from the NRK State Channel was uh, arrested in Doha because they filmed the uh, workers at the football stadiums there. They were arrested, put in prison for 48 hours, I think. They took their cameras, all their footage, and now they're back in Norway. And Norway has, of course, complained, and the FIFA organization just uh, shake their shoulders and say, oh, well, they film illegally somewhere. So this is still going on, this kind of uh, thinking that was in the Soviet Union. Uh, well, making animation can be hell because it's very technical, and making uh, animated documentary is not easy, especially when you're coming from documentary and you want to make the film as you go along, not to have the script finished and then normally, and I had uh, experience from animation from before, so normally you do a lot of preparation before you actually start animating anything, because that's so, that's so, uh, it costs a lot of money and if you, you don't want to throw any material out when you're doing uh, animation, it's the opposite of doing documentary, because there you use some some of the footage, like 10, 20 percent, and the rest you never use. In animation, if you do that, you're bankrupt within a year, basically. So, so what we did that we we did pre-visualization and storyboarding and changing all the time the visuals of the animation so that Elsie could use this as part of the editing of the documentaries and uh, the, the materials and and, and uh, interviews, and then it became more and more animation as we went along. In the beginning we thought maybe something like 60-40 and we ended up with 80% of animation. And I think we threw out maybe just a minute or one and a half minute of animation in the end. So it was a tedious process and I'm happy that I had this uh, technical uh, experience with animation before we started. And also that we, the both of us agree that this is going to be a personal long-term project. We worked for it for 
35 years. No, that's not true. Eight, nine years. <laughs> so, so we took our time and, and we kind of, we did other uh, projects also at the same time. So we were not depending on kind of this moving forward as a And, and ju just to put it in the, in the context, I was talking to Wills uh, uh, just earlier on and she said your son and daughter are now young adults because those uh, images were shot nine years ago, so they're not kids anymore, right? That's true. <laughs> and, and I'm not in those shots because I'm doing the filming, actually, on the beach. Yeah. Yeah, uh, our, our, uh, my sister's uh, daughter, she, when she saw the first rough cut, she said, I remember being almost, how old was she? I, I remember you started talking about this movie when I could barely walk. And now it's finished, and then that's how we lived with this movie. But some projects need to be like that, I think. Actually, my wife is very reluctant to use herself in her movies, uh, and it takes longer when you do that for some people. So we knew from the beginning we just have to build the whole process around that fact. And Ilza, going back to the documentary bit, uh, you used brand new footage. Eels are not wanting to be in the movie, but she is. Um, family pictures, and you use images from your documentary, which was called My Mother's Farm, that you shot in 2008, distributed in 2008, and archive footage. So, what was the challenge of assembling all this material? And we should give a shout out to your editors, Julie Vinton and Rainis Rinka. Yeah. Um I am really grateful to my editors. Uh, I have worked with uh, Yulia Minton for uh, oh, uh, 12 years, I think. Uh, I know her from the previous work. And then she was going to maternity leave and I started to work with Rain Srinka. And he is, uh, you know, film editor and the text editor also. So he was really great help to, for me to get the perspective of outside. Uh, he is much younger than me, and he was asking all the time, you know, okay, that's uh, uh, easy peasy for you, you understand it, but imagine again the perspective of people who haven't heard about those Soviet times, and maybe from abroad, and uh, he was uh, all, all the time pushing me to, to, to look at every detail from the two kind of uh, perspectives, so it really helped um, to, to get together. Uh, so one last question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, Ilka, your friend, contemplated suicide, uh, which really puts everything into perspective. Ideology does not only limit your freedom, but it also has a massive impact on your mental health. So can you talk a little, little bit about that? Yeah. Um, Ilka... Uh had a really bad experience when we finished uh, the eighth grade. And uh, we knew about it, but we never spoke about it. We, we, we are close friends. She's godmother of my daughter. And uh, there again, some, some, some children asked me, why didn't you become a journalist? And I said, you see, I'm not that tough. So. <laughs> Uh, at the end, I like more to tell stories than to be a tough journalist. So I recorded the interview with Ilga uh, again in the very beginning when we started to work on it in 2013. And her answers were too long and too unconcrete. And then when we were going uh, to close the film, my editor Rinka said, you have to reshoot this. It's, uh, we are struggling to get it uh, together. So I called her and said, Ilga, please save me. Uh, let's talk it about one more time. And I had to get tougher to get more concrete answers from her. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant thing because she said she avoids to think about it. It's traumatic. But in the premiere uh, in Riga last year in September, her kids watched the film and they were very moved because she isn't talking about that experience at home either. And Ilga's kids, they got a real strong experience and they got so proud of their mother. It was so uh, funny to meet those kids then. 
So this is uh, the right moment to open it up to the audience. If you have Could I just ask you um, a question? And I don't want you to feel insulted in any way. But why did you choose to use English as the main language of the film and speak it with a foreign accent? Yeah, I got the feeling that it was kind of an artistic choice that you will feel uh, the strangeness of Soviet people by doing this. And I, I got the idea that I want to promote the Latvian accent in English. Uh, to, because you all can recognize French and German and Russian accents in the film, but I thought, oh, let's make the Latvian accent known too. Uh, but uh, the thing is, we uh, have made film in Latvian too, and I found it also that when it's screened in television, um, kind of you can pay more attention to the picture when you hear the the language you are more. Uh, familiar with, which is English, actually. But uh, I, I got this feeling that there is this uh, nice stiffness in our accent, which uh, kind of, I feel, tributes to the feeling that you are in some other era, some other time, uh, not now, because those people speak a bit strange. And actually, that was very funny. When I asked children, small children, to come and dub uh, the film, um, the Latvian children, they were perfect in saying Lenin in English, and then they had to say Lenin in Latvian, and they couldn't pronounce it, because it's a Russian word, and they don't know Russian anymore. So we had to coach them to, uh, to say Lenin in, uh, in, 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 in the Latvian pronunciation, but since the person is gone from the vocabulary, uh, they used it kind of as a password when they came to the sound studio and opened the door, and the parents said, we have trained at home to say Lenin. And uh, I, I thought it was a beautiful picture of the changes of the generations, because in English, it is all fluent for them. And the, those Soviet things were strange. And uh, like for the other actors, I, I also I, I watched. Let's keep our accent. Yeah. <laughs> and that brings our um, discussion about my favorite war to a close. Uh, can you please join me in thanking again Ilse and Tron, all the way from Norway. Thank you very much.